Good morning, everyone. My name is Grace Coleman, and I'm the president and CEO of Crisis Center North, a domestic violence counseling and educational resource center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. On behalf of the Keystone Link Coalition, I would like to welcome you to this presentation on the link between the animal and human violence presented by Phil Arco of the National Link Coalition. This webinar is graciously funded by the Richard King Mellon Foundation. A quick note of welcome and information on logistics today. We ask that everyone attending fill out a Keystone Link evaluation, which will be shared digitally during the seminar. And you will also receive an email post this seminar. Please note for those of you who either cannot sit in on an entire workshop or need to view at another time, this recording will be available to you for a month after the seminar. For those of you who would like to receive 1.5 credits from, N from NASWPA, please fill out the Safer Together evaluation form from the NASW and submit it to NASWPA. Credits will be available for those that view the recording by taking a post-test. This information will also be provided to you via email along with a link to the recording post the seminar. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Nancy Blaney, the Director of the Government Affairs from the Animal Welfare Institute in Washington, DC. Take it away, Nancy. Thank you, Grace. Uh, thank you for that lovely welcome. And hello, everyone. Uh, we're so happy to have you here today. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my colleague, uh, today's speaker. Uh, you all have his uh, bio I think you received in your materials. It is a humbling experience to read that. And as it would take an awful lot of time from this fabulous program that he has for you, I will just say that Phil has been extreme, Phil Arco, the uh, director of the National Link Coalition, is more than generous in sharing the experience and the knowledge that he has acquired over many, many years. Phil, I will spare you any details about how many years that has been that we have been working together, but you are about to get a lot of information about this very crucial uh, um, issue of uh, cross-reporting, coalition building, and the link between animal abuse and other forms of violence. Please be sure to uh, visit the website for the National Link Coalition and to sign up for the link letter. It is such a valuable resource of information, you won't regret it. But I'm going to turn it over to you, Phil, to get started on this program of great information for this large audience. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for the glowing introduction. Yeah, we've been around the, the horn with this since we were both puppies. <laughs> and so yeah, I can really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, we've both been involved with this for 40 years plus. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Phil Arco. I'm the director uh, of the National Link Coalition, editor of the link letter, which Nancy mentioned. And yes, please uh, just email me down below and sign up for it. We'd love to have more people. Uh, we already have 5,400 people around the world that are reading this every month, and it's completely free. I'm going to cover an awful lot of ground today. I'm going to rush through this to try to get it in in time to allow for some questions and answers, which we'll save to the end. If you have any questions, just add them into the chat room, and somebody's going to be curating them, and, and then uh, I'll try to answer as many as I can. If we can, I'll get to them offline later. I'm going to focus an awful lot on Pennsylvania, but everything here is, is you know, for anywhere in the U.S. I know we have people across the country. Uh, I'm going to do a lot of focus specifically on social work, but again, this is, uh, pertains to anybody in human or humane services. And it's about the link and how nobody in any of these fields has enough resources to do an adequate job. But by pooling our limited resources, we get additional eyes and ears out there to solve the problems of family and community violence that are affecting all of us. And the secret to this is this diagram in the lower left-hand corner. I'll get back to this again. It's the link diagram, and it shows that the four forms of family violence, animal cruelty, domestic violence, child abuse, and elder abuse, are not in silos. They're, they're linked. And people working in any of these fields um, or in other social services can multiply can often see multiple forms of family violence. And it's imperative that we begin to develop systems for cross-reporting, cross-referrals, recognition. I call it the three R's of recognition, referral, and reporting to each other. Um, we'll talk about interdisciplinary opportunities in the link. I'm gonna give you a brief 
overview of this. I understand there are two more workshops in this uh, series coming up later this year on child abuse and elder abuse. I'll be touching on those. Those workshops will go into that in more detail. Talk about species spanning cross-reporting between humane and human services, and the progress we're making and some of the challenges we're still facing. Reasons why social work and social services need to consider these three R's in their work. I'll talk about career opportunities and all this because I think that's a, a barrier for getting social work in particular to address this issue, figuring that, you know, there's no there's no money in it, there's no career opportunities, and that's not true. There are. And again, ask your questions in the chat room. National Link Coalition is the we're the global resource center on all this. And as I mentioned, our link letter has 5,400 people around the world. We've been around since 2008. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. So yes, please feel free to donate to us. We work in four primary areas. We raise public and professional awareness through trainings like this. Uh, we showcase fabulous multidisciplinary programs and Crisis Center North in Pittsburgh is as great an example as any. We work uh, on public policy and right now we have 123 bills in state legislatures and Congress that we're following that address this link. And then we substantiate all this with academic research. We have over 2,200 citations in our bibliography for anybody who's doing research. Goal of all this is to make communities safer. We can be safer together by getting more people to recognize that human and animal violence are intertwined and the violence prevention efforts of all of us are much more effective. We can intervene earlier if we work together. And there's our website, nationallinkcoalition.org. There's my email. Feel free to, you know, check this all out. The basics of the link, uh, link 101, animal abuse is a red flag. Um, and a species spanning collaboration between human and humane services can be much more effective if we recognize animal abuse as one of the earliest potential warning signs of other family and community violence. And I emphasize potential. It doesn't always mean that every little boy who kicks the cat is gonna grow up to become a serial killer, but he might. Um, and so it's a very significant warning sign that just can't be ignored anymore. Um, Cross-reporting collaborations increase the number of eyes and ears in the community. It improves the synergy of them linking the agencies in the community, none of which have adequate resources gives us earlier op intervention or a more effective prevention and response, and it reduces unnecessary duplication of services. And if we take more strong efforts to prevent, to prosecute, and punish animal cruelty, it certainly benefits man's best friend, but it also benefits man, and it really benefits woman. And that's the key to this. As I'll talk about in a moment, legislators don't care about animal welfare issues but they do care about human safety issues. And the link makes that bridge so that we all are working together on the same page. Unfortunately, the four spheres of family violence have traditionally been in silos. And the animal cruelty component was always on the periphery because people always think, oh, it's only an animal. Human needs always come first. It's just basic human nature. The fact is, it wasn't until the early 1990s that the three human services sectors began talking to each other. First national conference on the impact of domestic violence on children didn't take place until 1992. It was about the same time that people began to realize that, el that domestic violence also affects older people as well. But the animal folks were always on the periphery until we started talking about the link back in the early 1990s. We changed that model to this diagram here, which as I said, shows they overlap. And this motto of the link is very simple. When animals are abused, people are at risk. And when people are abused, animals are at risk. We're not saying animals are more important than people. The key to this is that in a civil society, no form of family violence or community violence can be tolerated. By focusing on the link, by spanning the species, we do a much more effective job. I'm gonna describe eight distinct types of link that we've identified over the decades. The most prevalent and common one is the domestic violence issue. It's all about power and control. And the abuser, who's usually a man, and I'll emphasize we have women who you know abuse men, we have intimate partner violence and same-sex relationships, but just for simplicity's sake, I'll assume it's a man abusing a woman. 
the abuser will find any weak link he can find, any point of vulnerability, and it's often the household animals because it's the women and the kids who have the emotional attachments to them. And by threatening or harming or killing the animals, she and the kids are afraid to leave. They're trapped in the toxic relationship. And depending on which study you look at, it's anywhere from 50% to 97% of women say they don't leave because of the fear for what will happen to their animals. And we know there are a lot of other reasons why she doesn't leave. And I don't mean to demean those other issues. They're extremely complex. But the fear of the animal's welfare is a huge barrier. It's a form of emotional extortion. We have a similar dynamic in child sexual abuse where the abuser warns the little boy or girl that if they talk, he'll strangle her bunny. And now the child is dealing with all sorts of multiple levels of physical trauma, emotional trauma, confusion, um, and now has to worry about you know saving his or her pet. We have adverse childhood experiences. Those of you in the child protection field are probably aware of this as a result of a study done uh, many years ago that looked at um, how adverse traumas in childhood affect people's long-term, not only their physical, their emotional health, but their physical health, and they take riskier behaviors uh, and they lead to earlier death. Not once in the ACEs study did they consider the fact that a child's exposure to animal cruelty or committing animal cruelty should be considered an adverse childhood experience. What we know is that children who commit animal cruelty is one of the earliest signs of conduct disorder, and it starts to show up at about the age of six and a half. Think about that for a minute. We have the issue of bullying, and it's not just youth who bully other youths who would be more aggressive towards animals, as you would expect, but it's also youths who have been bullied transfer all that negative energy that's directed at them and go lower on the totem pole and they'll target helpless animals. We have the issue of animal hoarding, which can affect any age population, but it tends to be more elderly, isolated women. Uh, but again, it can be men, it can be younger people, uh, it can be the wealthy as well, but it, it spans the spectrum, but it tends to be an older population where it's often linked with elder abuse and other issues uh, affecting seniors. I'll talk a little bit about that. Like I said, you're going to have a, a webinar on this later in the year in more detail on that. Dog fighting and cock fighting is linked with homicides, sex trafficking, narcotics, weapons offenses, and a wide range of other community crimes. And um, it's a huge issue. Animal sexual abuse is one of the newest areas of the link, probably the most disgusting to talk about. There are people out there who prefer to have sex with animals and they try to justify it as a legitimate sexual preference because the animals aren't complaining. The fact is it used to be legal everywhere. It is now illegal in 49 states because we have demonstrated how frequently it's linked with child pornography, particularly when it comes to online uh, pornography um, and also what are called crush videos where people get their sexual thrills watching other people stomping animals to death. And then the school shooters and the mass shooters. Um, right now, the current figures would indicate about 10% of them have been torturing animals. It's an enormous risk factor. I'll give you a couple of case studies this, uh, from our case files. Every issue of our link letter, we have a half a dozen or more cases from around the country. These are just a couple that I found recently from, from Pennsylvania. A case in Bucks County involved child abuse and hoarding, okay? Seven unschooled malnourished kids and 24 rats and other pets were removed from a home where the conditions were deplorable and the kids couldn't eat because the refrigerator was padlocked. A case in Berks County uh, linking child homicide and animal sexual abuse. A woman with a history of, of, of involvement with Child Protective Services hanged her two children with dog leashes and then sent photos of her having sex with a dog. Uh, closer to Pittsburgh and Westmoreland County, case of homicide linked with animal cruelty. A couple who had previously been charged with animal cruelty and neglect were facing the possible death penalty for the death of her son. Case of domestic violence and aggravated animal cruelty. A uh, guy was upset at his ex-wife, so he, uh, he shot her beagle. We see cases like this all the time. Animal abuse is the tip of the iceberg. And whoever investigates animal cruelty in a community, I'm going to put an asterisk next to that because that is an extremely complicated answer to who does that. 
um, will often find other family violence, but also substance abuse, family discord, marital problems, unemployment, a wide range of other social issues lurking below the surface. And the animal abuse is the tip of the iceberg because it's often the first point of contact for social services or law enforcement to get involved with a family in trouble. How did I get involved with all this? A couple of things were light bulb moments for me way back in the 1980s and put things on my radar screen. One is a Pennsylvania connection, the University of Pennsylvania, my alma mater. Uh, I was reading a research study. I was in Colorado Springs for 20 years when I you know, started this work. So I'm sitting in Colorado Springs and this paper crossed my desk from Philadelphia, from, the, uh, from, from Penn, from the School of Social Work. And a woman there doing a dissertation took a look at a year's worth of data from Bucks County's Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Bucks County SPCA and the Bucks County Child Protection Agency, and found that in 9% of the cases, they overlapped. Child protection and animal protection were dealing with the same families, the same victims, but they weren't talking to each other. They were in silos, they were in their blinders. And I remember looking at that and thinking what a horrible irony that is because the child protection movement came out of animal protection. The first humane societies in this country often protected animals as well, and that tradition continued up till about 1962. Um, that struck me as very, very ironic. I said, what's wrong with that picture? About the same time I was doing a training for teachers in Colorado Springs, I was the humane educator at our local humane society, brought in a local veterinarian to talk uh, about pet care. And at the time I was the humane movement's only delegate to the American Veterinary Medical Association's Animal Welfare Committee. And I saw 60,000 veterinarians trying to prove that they were the same, that they were real doctors, that they were equal to physicians. So I had a light bulb moment. I said, to ask the veterinarian, I said, Doc, every teacher in this room is mandated under Colorado law to report suspected child abuse. And I know everybody in human health care is a mandated reporter of child abuse, but what about veterinarians? Do you have to report? He thought a minute and he said, as a matter of fact, I do. Turned out Colorado was the only state in the country that specifically named vets as mandated reporters. In 49 states, it wasn't on their radar screen. I always like to joke that, you know, Colorado is much more progressive because of the altitude. People can see farther out there. Anyway, I then said, OK, Doc, that's interesting. Let me ask you another question. Would you have to report animal cruelty to us at the Humane Society? And he said, no, why would I ever want to do that? I might lose a client. And I thought, boy, what's wrong with that picture? Shouldn't the veterinarian be as proactive in responding to animal abuse as pediatricians are in responding to child abuse? And then I was the after-dinner speaker at our local domestic violence safe house's annual meeting. And I'm waiting to go on, and I'm looking through their newsletter just to find out a little bit about the organization. I open up a newsletter, and there on page three are these four drawings that have been drawn by kids in the shelter. And three of the four pictures were of animals that have been killed or hurt or threatened by mommy's abuser as a way to intimidate and coerce and control them and keep them from leaving. Well, fast forward and progress is starting to be made. It wasn't just me. There's a lot of people around the country who were working along this, these routes. Animals oriented social work began uh, to get involved. In 1978, Jamie Quackenbush, a social worker, instituted what we think was the first pet loss counseling program at the veterinary hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, another Pennsylvania connection there. Sue Cohen started uh, a social work program and human animal interaction programs at New York City's Animal Medical Center in 1982. And then uh, Elizabeth Strand back in 2002 coined this term veterinary social work and started this amazing program at the University of Tennessee it's a collaboration between the School of Social Work and the Veterinary School. And today we have several hundred veterin veterinary social workers, full-scale social workers working in veterinary hospitals. And now we're starting to get them working in animal shelters as well. Um, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Veterinarians are not trained to work with people. Social workers normally aren't trained to work with animals. Veterinary social work is the human side of veterinary medicine and the animal side of social work. And it involves four pillars, animal system therapeutic interventions, counseling clients on uh, 
euthanasia and you know, grief and bereavement when their animals are euthanized. Compassion fatigue uh, and conflict management for veterinary staffs. Right now, veterinarians have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. And then working on the link between animal abuse and human violence. A little bit about the link between domestic violence and animal abuse. I was sitting at my desk outside Philadelphia, get a call from a woman in the parking lot of a domestic violence shelter in La Crosse, Wisconsin, saying, help, they won't let me in. I've loved this dog longer than any relationship I've ever had, but the shelter won't let me bring my dog in. Um, I was able to help her find another shelter in Wisconsin that was pet friendly. And today we have over almost 300 pet friendly shelters in, in the US. The numbers involving this coercive control and domestic violence are pretty astounding. One study in Utah found 71% of women in their shelter uh, in, in domestic violence shelters reported harm or threats to the animals. Almost as frightening as that number is that almost one third of these women reported their children had hurt or killed animals. This was the inter is the intergenerational cycle of violence. A study in Wisconsin found, oh, you can see the numbers there, how many animal cruelty incidents occurred in the presence of the women or in the presence of the children as a way to warn them, I killed your cat, you could be next. We have found that pet abuse is one of the four most significant indicators of who is the greatest risk of becoming a domestic violence abuser. The study was trying to identify the biggest risk factors, and the first three risk factors didn't surprise anybody. History of substance abuse, mental health issues, and low education levels. But the fourth factor that they hadn't counted on was this history of actual or threatened animal abuse. Another study, I think that one was in Texas, found that animal, you know, uh, domestic violence abusers who also abuse animals are more dangerous and they use more controlling behaviors and more forms of violence. Andrew Campbell's fantastic work going on right now in Indianapolis found that, um, well, back up a second, you talk to any cop anywhere in the U.S. and he's going to say the cases they hate to investigate, the ones they fear the most are domestic violence incidents. And there's an extremely high risk of death to first responders in domestic violence cases. That risk of death doubles when there's also animal cruelty co-occurring with the domestic violence. Most recent study, the, the uh, hotline, and the Urban Resource Institute in New York. This was the first study that rather than interviewing people in shelters, these are people calling the hotline. And you can see the numbers there of how many women said keeping their pets with them is important in deciding whether to seek safety. Half of them won't leave if they can't take their pets with them or they fear the, uh, the guy's going to harm or kill the pets. 30% 30 said, 30 said the kids were aware of all this. And almost three quarters weren't aware of the fact that we now have, like I said, almost 300 pet-friendly domestic violence shelters in the U.S. Why do the abusers target the animals? Very simple, they can. The animals are convenient, they're soft targets. They do it because they're jealous, because she's more emotionally attached to the animals than she is to him. They do it because they think the cops won't care. And in many cases, unfortunately, they're right. And they do it because it works. It's a very effective technique. There are lots of reasons why she doesn't leave. Many victims say, you know, you've heard it all, you know, oh, I didn't mean to do it. It was my fault. He's getting better. You know, it was an accident. And what we have to tell them is, look, if he's hurting harmless animals, it's not the cat's fault. It's not your fault. There's something wrong with him. You and the kids and the animals need to say, start working on a safety plan and get all of you out of there ASAP. You may or may not be familiar with the Duluth model. For those of you who aren't all you know, give a brief introduction here. Many years ago, everybody thought domestic violence was just physical abuse. It isn't, it's about power and control. And the domestic violence agency in Duluth, Minnesota created this wheel that shows the eight dimensions of domestic violence, which are all about power and control with of course, physical abuse involving all of them. We've adapted this to show how animals fit into the power and control wheel. We have the coercion and the threats to the woman and the kids if she, uh, if she leaves or asserts any independence. There's an isolation factor. He won't allow her to go to the doggy park where you know all this great interaction takes place between people and their pets. He won't allow her to take the pets to the vet. Um, there's an emotional abuse. He may force her to eat out of the dog food bowl. 
He may force her to watch animal pornography. He may take the animal away, which may be the only source of emotional support that she has that's free and available 24 seven. There's economic abuse. He won't allow her to spend money on the pet's welfare. And then when the animals get sick, he blames her for that. There's the intimidation factor I've already mentioned saying, I did it to your dog, next time it'll be you. But it's also the pets of family and friends who help her escape that are threatened as well. If the kids get dragged into this, he'll harm the pets, blame it on mommy, and use that to drive a wedge between her and the kids. There's denial and blaming. He'll blame somebody else or blame the animal on it. And then we have this issue of legal abuse. Who owns this animal? Um, and then when this divorce, I'm sorry, when the domestic violence winds up in a divorce, who's going to get custody? We have a solution to that. And I'll talk about that in a minute here. I've been in animal shelters where one party brings an animal in and puts it up for adoption so the other party doesn't get it in the divorce settlement. We now have a solution to that issue. A little bit about animal abuse and child maltreatment. Uh, some of the research on this is, is equally compelling. Earliest study was done in New Jersey. Um, found 60% of families that were on investigation for child protection or by child protection also had abused or neglected pets. And where it was physical child abuse, the rate of animal abuse was a whopping 88%. Think about that risk factor. Two thirds of these cases where the, there was animal abuse the fathers were the guilty uh, parties, but in one third of the cases was the kids arming the animals. There were two things that came out of that that were quite surprising. Um, they found in these families where there's both child abuse and animal cruelty, there were 11 times more dog bites. So we have a physical health risk. We have a rabies risk, public health risk, as well as everything else going on. And surprisingly found that these families where there's child abuse and domestic violence going on tended to see veterinarians at pretty much the same rate as the general population. So vets will in fact see abused children. They say, no, I'll never see that. They will. These abusive households take their animals to the vet. Does animal abuse always lead to interpersonal violence? Not necessarily. Um, it's a potential risk. It's a very strong potential risk but not a guaranteed risk. What we do know is that kids who are aggressive, either to each other or to animals, that aggressive behavior is pretty stable and predictable by about the age of eight, often predicts antisocial behavior in adulthood, often part of an intergenerational transfer. And like I said, kids harming animals is one of the earliest signs of conduct disorder start showing up at about the age of six and a half. What we don't know is whether the animal cruelty is Part of the graduation hypothesis where they start out hurting animals need bigger and bigger kicks and move on to hurting people or whether it's part of a general pattern of deviance where it's just part of this overall constellation of antisocial behaviors and in fact it's that's more common than the graduation hypothesis but it's also a product of the home environment and abusive experiences and it can be something else or all of the above it's as complex as trying to understand the dynamics of interpersonal violence a little bit about elder abuse and animal abuse. Agencies working with seniors are often facing a population dealing with several stereotypical situations, particularly memory loss issues from Alzheimer's or dementia, cognitive uh, dysfunction or whatever. They're on fixed or low income, so they don't have transportation. Uh, they can't afford you know, proper care. They're physically limited, so they have those physical issues. They're often socially isolated. And those factors conspire to create a number of situations where their animals are involved. We have issues of the neglect of the pet. They love their pet deeply. They're deeply attached to them. But because of those factors, they can't give the pets proper care and the animals are neglected. And in fact, neglect is the most common form of animal cruelty, just as child neglect is more common than physical or sexual abuse. We not only have pet neglect, we have self-neglect, where they will take what limited resources they have and spend it on their animals instead of themselves. So they won't go into a hospital or long-term care or assisted living because there's nobody to care for their animals. And so they'll de delay their own welfare in order to you know, care for their pets. We have the attachment to the animals. 
With a senior, that can be an extremely deep attachment. This animal may be the last link to a spouse who passed away. This may be the only excuse he has to get out of the house and go for a walk. Maybe the only excuse she has to get up in the morning and give her a, a sense of purpose. And when that animal dies, it can be absolutely devastating to the senior. We have safety and health issues for caseworkers or home health aides or adult protective services who don't want to go into that house because it's overrun with cockroaches or mice because the dog food tins have piled up in the sink for weeks at a time or the litter box has never been changed. We have financial exploitation, the same coercion and control things that we see in domestic violence and child sexual abuse. I remember one case in Rhode Island, guy held his elderly mother's cat hostage for $20,000 in ransom money. We have the issue of the physically disabled with their depend, heavily dependent on their service animals and the spouse or partner is jealous because of that dependency and spending more time and more issues with the animals than she is with him. And then we have the animal hoarding issue, which like I said, can affect any age group, but it's often seniors. And whenever we have an animal hoarding case, it always involves a multidisciplinary response and there is no cure for it. The recidivism rate is 100%. And so an animal hoarding case brings in intense media coverage. It involves animal care and control and law enforcement, mental health interventions, social work, a wide range of social service agencies, public health, zoning enforcement, code enforcement, fire department, the courts, and we don't really have an adequate solution for it, whether it should be prosecuted or dealt with as a mental health issue. It's, it's a real complicated mess. What are the challenges for human services and social work in particular addressing all these link issues? First, we don't even know how many animals there are in the US. Uh, every time we ask the US census to tell us, you know, you know, to add questions about pets in the census, they turn us down. The extent of animal abuse is only recently been computed. Through our work at the National Link Coalition and several other agencies, back in 2016, we got the FBI to finally start including four forms of animal cruelty in their national incident-based reporting system. And there was a lot of misunderstanding at the time. People thought the FBI was, in, was investigating animal cruelty. They're not. But what we do have is a number of agencies around the country report their animal cruelty cases to the FBI, and they've broken it down to four main types. Every state law is going to be different, but the FBI typology is an easy way to think about it. We have neglect or gross neglect to animal hoarding and again that's the most common neglect is the most common form we have physical abuse uh, or non-accidental injury using the child uh, abuse technology uh, terminology we have animal sexual abuse and we have organized abuse which is dog fighting and cock fighting and you'll note there is no emotional abuse of animals as there is with elders or women or children. There's no such legal category as emotional abuse. Um, another challenge is that schools of social work in particular and human social services in general have not received a lot of training on this. Only 3% of schools of social work even mention the fact that their clients will have animals. And whatever that attachment is with them and their animals, can very distinctly affect their well-being, their decision-making, their quality of life. Um, so we need more social workers and social service agencies to be sensitive to the fact clients have animals and their clients' attachments to them, and that there are career opportunities in this area, which I'll describe in a minute. But unfortunately, 97% of schools of social work don't even mention this at all. We have the irony and the challenge that we are in a society of silos and animal cruelty cases always involve a lot of problem solving that crosses many disciplinary areas. So we have situations where, you know, we have a, a case and human services says it's not in my mandate. There's no place in, I think, you know, put this categorize it, deal with it. And animal shelters say, no, I work with animals, not with people. And law enforcement says, I deal with people, not with animals. And so often nothing gets done. That's why we need the three R's, recognition, referral, and reporting. The, as I mentioned earlier, the child protection field came out of animal protection. Henry Bird founded the ASPCA, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in 1866. 
and eight years later was asked to intervene and extract little Mary Ellen from an abusive household. And many local humane societies, SPCAs, had this dual function of animal cruelty prevention and child abuse prevention until the Connecticut Humane Society was the last one to divest of that dual role in 1962 because of the passage of the Federal Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act in 1971, I believe that was, uh, which made it a government function. By the way, here's a key point. Uh, you're used to, you know, a state child protection system, a state elder abuse protective system. Animal cruelty is all handled exclusively on the local level by local nonprofits or municipal or county animal services agencies. Uh, they do not collaborate. They all operate independently with a wide range of capabilities and training and capacity. They're not there 24-7. There's no 24 seven hotline or services available. And so it's very disappointing as, you know, to try to get immediate uh, react uh, resolution of those issues. Also the ASPCA is not the head of a local SPCA and the Humane Society of the United States doesn't tell a local Humane Society what to do. They're all independent organizations. We also have the challenge that people in the human services just aren't aware of how darn many animals there are out there. And I'll use Pennsylvania as an example. With about 13 million people and about six and a half million women, has about 3 million uh, children in Pennsylvania, but about 3 million dogs and about 3.2 million cats. There are more cats than kids in Pennsylvania. 39% uh, of Pennsylvania households have dogs, 29% have cats, 61% have one form, have one kind of pet. Uh, or another. And believe it or not, Pennsylvania has one of the lowest rates of pet ownership of any state in the country. Here's another way to look at it. More homes in America have pets than have kids. We spend more money in this country on pet food than we do on baby food. There are more dogs in America than there are people in most countries in Europe, and there are more cats than dogs. And if that doesn't get you, I, this bottom one scares the heck out of me. Gail Nelson was at Purdue University. She came up with this a number of years ago. She said a child in America today is more likely to grow up with a pet than with a live at home father. So for any of you working with kids, think of the implications of that. If you are not asking about the child's relationship with their animals, whether they're stable and they've had the pets for a long time, whether they come and go, whether they're dangerous, whether the kids have gotten bitten, whether um, there's been animal abuse, think of all the pieces of the puzzle you're missing in trying to understand that child's ecosystem. We have another challenge, which is that animals are property, which does not connect with how people think about their animals. Enormous disconnect here. 97%, I'm sorry, 99% of us think of our pets as family members or close companions. Only 1% of us think of their pets as property. The fact is the law says they are property. They're chattel property. It comes from the same Latin root as cattle, okay? A dog or a cat or a hamster or a gerbil is in the same category as a toaster as far as the law is concerned. But no abused woman ever ran back to her abuser to rescue her toaster. But they do go back time and time again. I think the national average now is takes her seven times before she can leave for good. She go back time and time again for lots of reasons. And one big reason is she's afraid of what will happen to her, her animals. Another issue we need to think about here is where are these pets located? And over, excuse me, overwhelmingly, they are in families with children. More than two thirds of pets are in homes with children under age six. I'm going to rephrase that. <laughs> two thirds of households with kids under age six have pets and almost three quarters of homes with children over age six have pets. And who cares for them? Invariably the woman in the household. We know the story, the kid says, mommy, the puppy followed me home. Can we take care of him? Please, please, um, you know, be responsible. And mommy says, yes, it'll teach you responsibility. But of course, mommy winds up becoming the, the caregiver. The pet becomes a surrogate child. Overwhelmingly, women are the caregivers in the household. That gives the abusers that point of vulnerability. And that's also an issue for veterinarians who will, in fact, see mom and the kids coming in for, you know, treating the pets 
and the veterinarian has to be primed to recognize all these forms of family violence, and we're just starting to get them there. Pets can be vital members of people's support system, particularly people in crisis. They facilitate a sense of social capital. That's the glue that holds communities together, a term coined by Robert Putnam in 2000, who found that people, um, you know, it's the sense of trust and communitarian spirit that seems to have disappeared uh, from our lives. The research study um, back in, uh, started in Australia and came to the U.S. found that people with pets vote more often. They trust their neighbors more often. They, they exercise outside more often. That became critical during the pandemic. Um, pets facilitate communication and sense of safety. The relationship that people have with their animals often mirrors their interpersonal relationships. If we ask clients or patients about their animals, it can identify risk factors and resiliency factors and give us clues to their individual uh, functioning and the family's function. Because animals slip under the radar of our defense mechanisms, an animal's presence and information about that can open the window. You know better than I do when you're dealing with a client in crisis. You know, their, ba their barriers are up, their defenses are up, they're scared, they're in crisis, they don't trust the system. But if you ask them about their animals, they open up. People love to talk about their pets. And it's a fabulous way to build rapport, fabulous way to show you care and to find out, you know, what's really going on in that household. And I'm going to give you three questions here in a minute that you can ask. Whether we're kids, whether we're adults, whether we're seniors or anywhere in between, pets can be sources of companionship and social support. It really lasts across the lifespan. And we really see this during times of crisis and disasters. We saw this most vividly during Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, but any natural disaster, we see the same thing where the people won't get on the helicopter, they won't get off the rooftop if they can't take their pets with them. One of the things that came out of Katrina was the Pet Evacuation and Transportation Standards Act, which now allows FEMA funding to support the pets in a community, and that has been working nicely. This is a global phenomenon. Uh, the last time I was lecturing in uh, Japan was shortly after the Fukushima nuclear meltdown, and I love these pictures. The one in the upper right-hand corner, woman's getting her dog tested for radiation with a Geiger counter. The one on the left there, we just can't imagine the devastation they went through, but they took their pets with them. And I love the one on the bottom, a woman, elderly woman in a refugee center, feeding her dog grains of rice with chopsticks. That's what this human-animal bond is all about. And like I said, it's global. This is from Fort McMurray, Alberta, in Canada, the wildfires they had there a couple of years ago. Not just dogs and cats, it can be horses and other animals as well that are affected by natural disasters and people have this intense human animal bond to protect them. So why should people in human services care about all this? Well, we need to redefine the word family to make sure that it includes the companion animals in that household. The presence of those uh, companion animals or pets enhances social capital. Asking about pets can build rapport and trust Kids' experiences with pets can have lifelong implications. Um, talking about animal abuse can often reveal other family violence, and pet loss can't be ignored. You can't say, oh, it's only a cat, you'll get another one. For anybody, particularly a child, that can be as devastating as the loss of a human family member. But we're challenged because, like I said, only 3% of schools of social work mention the human-animal bond. And the traditional family systems theory looks like this. You have kids, there may be a parent or two, there may be extended family, there's a community, and if they even think about pets at all, and they usually don't, they're out there on the periphery. And it's not just social work or social services. Veterinarians, if they're lucky, might make a quarter of what a physician makes. Animal care and control agency, you see those appealing, you know, heartbreaking ads for the ASPCA on TV, and you think they get all the money. Of all charitable donations in this country, only about one half of 1% goes to animal welfare causes, companion animals. And municipal animal shelters, if they're lucky, will get about four tenths of 1% of the municipal budget 
to do an amazing job. So we need to change the dynamic and get rid of that model and replace it with this. And just recognize that when we're talking about family, we need to include the companion animals there. Another way, particularly for social workers, you're familiar with the genogram. This is not a genealogy chart. It's a way to look at the emotional attachments that's going for three generations with a household. And we have models of the genogram that includes people's interactions and emotional attachments with their horses and their dogs and their cats and their hamsters and any other animal as well. So with all this information, how do we get all these different professions to implement interagency recognition, reporting, and referrals? Well, we've got a lot of ways to do it. And I'm going to give you a number of uh, suggestions here. The first is to recognize the animal abuse link in child protection and child sexual abuse agencies. Failing to do this can have tragic consequences. There's an article in the New York Times from a number of years ago. Four-year-old boy in Brooklyn was mauled to death by a cane corso. It's a kind of a dog. It's an Italian mastiff, the kind of dog that could eat a pit bull for lunch. And when you read, read this, when you read the story, it's really illustrative. Next door neighbor said it was a tragedy waiting to happen. Boy's family had lived in the apartment for three years. They had you know, other pets, a dog, a parrot, and fish. Okay. But the woman's boyfriend was attack training this dog, you know, with a big protective suit and a big guard on his arm. He was out in the street. Everybody would run and hide when he was out there. Everybody in the neighborhood was petrified of the dog. Well, uh, Child Protective Services had visited the house, but had never did anything involving the dog. They didn't recognize it as a potential threat. And I spent a number of years doing training for child welfare agencies in New Jersey. And it just absolutely appalled me. I would ask them, i say, not just the animal cruelty. Do you look at any animals there that might threaten the kid? Okay, Because we know of several cases in Florida and New Brunswick and Canada, this New York case. I know at least four cases where kids whose families were under investigation by CPS were killed by animals in the home. And talking to the New Jersey and other child welfare agencies, they say, we don't look for the animals out there. We have them put in another room because if we get bit, you know, it's a worker's comp claim. And I'm going, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? If you're afraid of the animal, what do you think life is like for that kid whose welfare you're supposed to want to protect? Pet keeping can be a pivotal point of our childhood by autobiographies. And if I had more time and, you know, have some interaction here, but just think back in your own childhood about the puppies that followed you home from school or the cat that had a litter of kittens in the closet or the dog you bought from the pet shop or the calf you raised at 4-H or increasingly, you know, the dog that was stabbed to death by mommy's abusive boyfriend as a way to warn her that she could be next. If you're working with children now, whatever experiences they're having with animals can reverberate and resonate down the course of their lifespan. Our childhood memories last a lifetime. I love to joke about this one, just to lighten this, this topic up. Yes. You can name it whatever you want, but be sure it's something you remember because you'll be using it as a security question answer for the rest of your life. Um, people remember their childhood experiences. And I spent 20 years visiting elderly people in nursing homes and the stories they remember from 80 years ago with their pets would just knock your socks off. I mentioned Gail Melson earlier. She wrote this great book. I commend it highly. It's called Why the Wild Things Are. Not Where the Wild Things Are. That's Marie Sendak. But Animals in the Lives of Children. And what Gail found, she did a literature search. And she found children's literature and their media saturated with animals. Cartoon characters and the books they read, the images in their pajamas, the mobiles hanging over the bed. She found that of the first 50 words that kids speak, once they get past mama and data, it's doggy and ducky and kitty and horsey. She did a content analysis of fairy tales and found fairy tales have more animals in them than fairies. She found for many children, the death or disappearance of the pet is the first experience of loss. We don't have extended families like we used to. Grandma and grandpa aren't hanging around the house. They're cruising you know, Florida and they're Winnebago. And for a child, particularly a child under stress, that animal might be the only source of emotional comfort that's available 24 seven. 
what I'm concerned about what happens with kids, particularly minority populations, inner city populations in many cases that don't have that pet connection. I love this book as well. It's called Last Child in the Woods, Saving Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Richard Liu wrote this a number of years ago and describing the fact that kids don't know how to build tree houses anymore and they play soccer on the soccer pitch, but they never go off and explore the woods behind. And they don't go you know, riding their bikes through the woods anymore. They don't know about nature and pets can be ambassadors from nature with that healing power of nature right there in their living rooms and bedrooms. Um, this was a full page ad in the Philadelphia Inquirer for Comcast, um, you know, trying to promote Wi-Fi is available in all places. And here are kids in the pup tent in the backyard. And what are they doing? They're watching a device. OK, I mentioned being in uh, Japan on doing a couple lectures there. One time I went to the Tokyo Children's Museum and here's a young child and the mother playing an interactive video game. And what's the name of this video game? Nature Contact. Something is really wrong with society when, you know, we need devices to connect with nature. Chris Risley Curtis uh, retired is from the School of Social Work at Arizona State. I love what she said. She said, it doesn't matter if you as a social worker are animal friendly. If your clients are, it's an issue. Addressing animal issues is one more way to help humans. But if you don't look and you don't ask, you won't know. Um, again, look for dangerous animals in your uh, in your home investigations or in your assessments or your intakes or whatever you're doing there. As I mentioned, we had several cases where we're kids have been, that we know of where kids have been killed by animals while their families are under investigation. And include these findings in your report. Uh, and because this may be important in evi uh, evidentiary importance in court trials, dispositions, custody rights, visitation rights, protection orders, also, you know, if this animal has been in the home for years and years, that's one thing, but we often find there's this turbulent turnover and they get animals and get rid of them, get animals, get rid of them. That really shows me that they don't know how to make stable attachments and long-term uh, commitments. Include the child's emotional attachment to a pet as a protective factor uh, for the child's resiliency. Treat the death or disappearance of that pet as significant. Don't blow, blow it off as, as trivial. And again, recognize that witnessing or causing the abuse or death of a pet can be and should be considered an adverse childhood experience, a trauma. Barbara Boat, the University of Cincinnati Medical Center has been leading the charge with this. As I mentioned this earlier, these adverse childhood experiences harm our developing brain architecture, make people uh, hyper-responsive over the long-term to perceive threats, leads to earlier death and the adoption of risky health behaviors, we need to close the gap and consider a child's exposure to animal cruelty as an ACE. Another opportunity here is with therapy animals in children's advocacy centers and courtrooms. Uh, organization out of the Seattle area is leading the, the work in this. It's courthousedogs.org. We have several hundred dogs that provide emotional support to child abuse and child sexual abuse victims to help them confront their abusers, whether it's in a children's advocacy center in the courtroom, working with CASA, Guardians at Litem, working with Victim Services Center. It's not just the US, we're seeing this overseas as well. Third opportunity here is to get social workers and, and social service agencies more intertwined with animal shelters. And I love this quote here, it came out about from a market research study a number of years ago. Let me read it to you. It says, the philosophy in the animal welfare community is switching to addressing human problems that underlie crises with animals. The service philosophy in animal shelters is evolving to recognize that treating the symptoms of animal welfare, such as animal homelessness, abuse, and neglect, is only a stopgap solution. To be truly effective, the underlying causes, such as community and family dysfunction and violence, have to be addressed. The four pillars of veterinary social work are equally relevant in a, an animal shelter. The staff in animal shelters is incredibly stressed and incredibly drained emotionally. They are dealing with animal suffering on a cosmic scale. Uh, years and years ago, I wrote about the animal shelters as being one of the 007 professions. They have a license to kill. They have to make life and death decisions every single day. 
the clientele in the shelter is often abusive. Um, the public has a very negative perception of many of them. There's this huge schism that I don't want to get into between open admission shelters and no kill shelters. And so, you know, people in the open admission shelters are dealing with all that garbage. Um, the staff get attached to the animals as well. Uh, voluminous caseloads, it's not unusual in a large city for an animal shelter to take in 200 animals a day. So the caseloads are enormous. And needless to say, there's not a lot of money in that pot. Field officers often are not trained to assess or respond to human problems. Um, because of, you know, animals always being on the periphery of human services, human services agencies don't interact with them, and so the animal shelters are isolated. We have the same conflicts between staff and volunteers that we see in any kind of a nonprofit organization. Meanwhile, the clients um, may be undergoing domestic child or elder abuse themselves. They need help with finding homes for their animals. That's why they're in the shelter. They need either foster care because they're going to the hospital or they're moving or they're military and they're relocating, um, or they're in domestic violence situations and they need transition housing for themselves and their pets. They need to know that they can include pets in domestic violence protection from abuse orders now in 40 states. I'll show you the map here in a minute. We need to help them establish ownership so that if it does come down to a uh, divorce settlement, she has a better chance of getting custody if she's the primary caregiver. We have the animal hoarding situation, which, as I said, always involves multiple interventions and social work can be right in the middle of all that. We have the pet loss and grief counseling in animal shelters, as we do in veterinary hospitals. People coming in animal shelters don't often know about what social service resources are available to them. Um, they also, uh, in the domestic violence shelters, they don't realize how to include pets in their safety planning uh, procedures. The public doesn't know who to call to report suspected animal abuse. I mean, I had an email from one of the participants in this call the other day. I'll, I'll get into that here in a second. And of course, animal shelters often provide animal assisted therapy programs for at risk populations. These are great areas where social work and social services can make a difference. We can counsel the staff and volunteers to reduce that compassion fatigue, setting up pet loss support groups, diffusing these contentious confrontations with clients. Connecting pet owners with the social service programs that are out there. We have low-cost veterinary services, mobile veterinary services, low-cost spay-neuter programs, pet food banks, animal behaviorists who can solve pet behavior problems, the domestic violence shelters, the elder abuse program, and other social service agencies. We can develop safety nets to provide pet foster care so somebody doesn't have to surrender their animal when they're going into domestic violence housing or medical uh, housing as well. We would love to see more schools of social work allow their, get, allow their students to do their field placements in animal shelters. Instead of the you know, administrator saying that isn't relevant to social work, yes, indeed it is. And if you have a student who wants to work, you know, do an internship or a field placement in a shelter, please encourage it. Um, we can implement animal-assisted interventions, animal-assisted therapy programs with at-risk youth and, and youthful offenders. We have a lot of programs like that all around the country. Just heard about one yesterday in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, that's working in a prison. Um, we can cross-train animal shelter and social service agencies on their overlapping investigations, because so many of these cases involve multiple ag agencies. Big challenge is finding pet-friendly housing. A lot of people turn their animals into shelter because they can't find, find a pet-friendly apartment. Domestic violence agencies need pet-friendly transition and permanent housing as well. Okay, Very simple answer to that. Have volunteers in both groups compile a list of pet-friendly apartments and, and rentals in that community. Uh, we can establish collaborative link coalitions like Keystone Link in Pennsylvania, which is you know, a showcase for one of our are great local coalitions going on. Animal shelters can collaborate, not only with domestic violence shelters, but shelters for the homeless, Meals on Wheels programs, and many other agencies. Who do you call? We were getting so many calls, particularly from veterinarians who didn't know who to call to report suspected abuse. We started this campaign. We called, who are you gonna call? Abuse busters. 
because in any given community, it could be the SPCA or Humane Society, it could be animal control or animal services, it could be the police or the sheriffs or nobody. I mean, believe it or not, we have agencies in this country that are under the control of the fire department. Nobody knows what to do with animal welfare issues. Like I said, they're all handled locally. If you go to our website, nationallinkcoalition.org, you will see on the left side a list of 50 states. <laughs> we have a direct national directory of 6,500 cities and counties in this country with who you should call. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to get answered. Doesn't mean they're going to, they're there 24 seven. Doesn't necessarily mean they care about it because in many cases it just defaults to the police or sheriff because there is no designated animal control or animal welfare agency in that area, particularly in rural areas. That's a huge issue. There is no consistency to this. And there is, like I said, no national program. The FBI is not investigating animal cruelty. We need to include pets in safety planning. Um, safety, for those of you not familiar with this, this was a concept that came about a number of years ago, training women to have everything ready to go at a moment's notice, because she may only have a brief window to escape the abuser. Well, now we're trying to get the animals included in that, the pet food supplies, the leashes, the collars, the licenses, everything else she's gonna need to get her and the kids and the pets out of there. Go to our website, we have a whole resources section there that includes samples of pet safety, uh, safety planning that includes pets. We're also encouraging get all the documentation in her name, the license, the rabies shot, the microchips, the vaccination, the pet food bills. The more she can show she's the primary caregiver, better chance she's going to have to get custody. There is pet friendly animal sh uh, domestic violence shelters now. This program is called Safety sheltering animals and families together. Website is safetyprogram.org. Almost 300 pet-friendly shelters in the U.S., many more overseas, what I whimsically call doggy witness protection programs. And Allie Phillips, who started this program, has a startup manual to help domestic violence shelters um, become pet-friendly. Pennsylvania has five, including Crisis Center North, but obviously we need many more in Pennsylvania. And if you go to the safety directory or some of the other resources that are out there, we have safeplaceforpets.org, domesticshelters.org, the Animal Welfare Institute Safe Havens Mapping Program. You can see lists of shelters that are either pet friendly or at least have a foster care program in place to allow women to escape with their pets. And the pets will either be housed with them or off site you know, with a foster care program. Red Rover also has this great collaborative program with, with Purina. It's called the Purple Leash Project. Lots of grant money available um, through that and through the PAWS Act, which is a federal program, to help domestic violence shelters build kennels to house the animal victims of domestic violence. What can social workers do in a domestic violence shelter? A lot. Start programs to incorporate questions about animals in the crisis line, in the intake, and in the risk assessments. Coordinate responses and referrals for survivors who need services for their pets. We should be distributing domestic violence literature in animal shelters and in veterinary clinics because the main clientele in those facilities are often women. Uh, in a domestic violence shelter, they can get information from the animal shelter, whether they've had any prior investigations of that household. We can bring animal assisted therapy teams into domestic violence shelters. Social workers can counsel children as well as the adults on the death or disappearance of pets. There is grant funding, as I mentioned, for building kennels. Social workers can help uh, administrators find that funding. They can help develop foster care programs with animal shelters or veterinarians or boarding kennels or other uh, animal related groups in the community. They can advocate for and help uh, clients in the shelter get pet protective orders. Um, these are domestic violence protection orders that include pets. Like I said, 40 states now specifically allow that. And again, finding pet friendly transition of person, uh, permanent housing. Uh, there's no reason why animal care and control agencies shouldn't be included in domestic violence as multidisciplinary teams and fatality review teams. 
there's no reason why staff uh, from domestic violence shelters can't be on an animal shelter board of directors and vice versa to get some cross fertilization that way. Another area for social workers in particular is legislative ad advocacy. Legislators don't prioritize animal welfare issues because dogs and cats don't vote, but their owners do. And that's the reason I gave you those percentages earlier of how many households have pets in Pennsylvania or any other state. When you tell legislators, no, the dogs and cats don't vote, but their people do, and they care about this. And the fact is most legislators do not want to hear about an animal issue because it brings emotionally crazy people out of the woodwork and they'd much rather deal with human issues that they're more familiar with. They just don't wanna talk about this at all. But the fact is by showing them that animal abuse hurts people, it's a public safety issue, they take notice. And the progress has been dramatic. Back in the early 1990s, only five states in this country had animal cruelty crimes that were considered felonies. Today, it's all 50. Doesn't mean all crimes are felonies but it shows that in many cases, animal cruelty is being treated much more seriously. And we have prosecutors and judges that are falling in line and beginning to recognize this. As I mentioned earlier, sex with animals used to be a perfectly normal uh, pattern and, and you know, just a lifestyle and particularly in rural areas because we've connected animal sex abuse with human sex abuse and child sex abuse, it's now illegal in 49 states. For some reason, West Virginia is still holding out. The states in dark blue there, uh, it's a felony. States in um, light blue, it's a, it's a misdemeanor. At least it's on the books in 49 states. And if we have anybody from West Virginia you know, on this uh, call, please connect uh, with your legislators there. I keep mentioning pet protection orders. 40 states now allow pets to specific, uh, now allow courts to specifically include pets in protection from abuse orders. Pennsylvania is a very distinct outlier. I don't know why this hasn't caught on in the Keystone State. And there are the states in the years that they uh, began uh, enacting these laws. It started in Maine in 2006 and it spread nationally across the country. 11 states now um, define coercive animal control in a domestic violence situation as an act of domestic violence, not just an act of animal cruelty, it's also an act of domestic violence and can be prosecuted and defined both ways. Pennsylvania doesn't have that yet. I mentioned the issue of who's getting you know, the solution, who gets custody of the animals in the case of a uh, divorce in seven states now courts can specifically award custody in the animal's best interest. I mean, they could always award custody anyway, but by putting it in the animal's best interest, it parallels what goes on in child custody cases. And that's a major step forward. Eight states still need laws that allow or require veterinarians to report suspected animal abuse. Pennsylvania does have a law in, vet in Pennsylvania, veterinarians are allowed to report suspected animal abuse and they have immunity from civil or criminal liability uh, for making a good faith report to an appropriate law enforcement or animal protection agency. The states in green are states where vets are permitted to report. States in dark blue are states where they're mandated to report. The check marks indicate states where they have immunity. So you can see on that map where you are. A bill was just introduced in Tennessee, by the way that would permit vets uh, to report. That just happened a couple of weeks ago here, but that hasn't been enacted yet. But in Pennsylvania, vets are permitted to report animal abuse. Cross-reporting between human services and animal services is a patchwork with absolutely no logic or reason whatsoever. We have a number of states where animal care and control agencies, animal services agencies are mandated to report child abuse or elder abuse. Adult Protective Services are mandated to report animal abuse. Child Protection Services are mandated to report animal abuse. You can see from that list, Pennsylvania isn't in any of those lists. So what we have in Pennsylvania is there's no cross-reporting officially enacted between child protection adult, and, and uh, animal protection or uh, adult protection and animal protection. At least veterinarians are permitted to report. Uh, we've got a long way to go in Pennsylvania. We need some legislation now. 
a lot of times people say, how do I know it's abuse? Okay. Well, the fact is you don't, yeah, and you don't have to. It's common sense. I don't have time to go into the details of that. Animal Welfare Institute has a great guideline. I believe that's going to be in your handouts. Uh, Nancy uh, providing that, I think, to all of you. Just some of the telltale signs, what child abuse looks like, what animal abuse looks like, what elder abuse looks like, what domestic violence looks like. The fact is, if you see something, say something. If you see somebody doing something to an animal or a child, you wouldn't do your own. Report it to the appropriate agency. Reporting doesn't mean the person's going to be thrown into jail or even charged. It's just going to trigger an investigation by the appropriate agency. They'll vet it and then decide what to do with it. We can increase community and professional awareness. I love this example here. Baltimore Police Department, years ago, started their first victim services unit. And they were about to go to press with these posters saying, you know, if you're in a domestic violence situation, call the police department. We've got victim services. We can help you. And it showed a woman and her child cowering in the corner, the shadow of the abuser looming over them. The woman who headed that program came to one of our trainings and the light bulb went on in her head. She said, duh, why didn't I think of that before? And through the wonders of Photoshop, she was able to insert, insert a dog in the photo. I mentioned that because it's common sense stuff and it doesn't cost a lot to make these changes. We need to improve awareness of all this, particularly within the field of social work. Get more schools to include not just the animal abuse link issue, but just the attachment, the human animal bond in the curriculum. We appreciate Pennsylvania NASW including this in the training. We need more state chapters of NASW to do this. And appreciate all you folks out there in child protection in Pennsylvania who are part of this. Again, need to see more states doing the same. I'm getting more literature about this in the social work literature because people tend to read only within their own professional tribal journals. I said earlier, I would give you three questions to ask. Ask your clients, are there animals at home? How are they cared for? And are you worried about their welfare? And it fills in the pieces of the puzzle, whether it's an intake or referral, safety planning information, assessments, treatment, wherever you can do this. It improves your assessment, improves your intervention. It builds rapport. It shows you're caring and it gets people talking about their pets. It's a nice, safe, neutral topic for them. Be sensitive to your clients with animals and the fact that they do have these attachments. And they do have issues with their pets or their livestock, which affect their uh, ability to make uh, decisions, affects their quality of living. Be aware of uh, what support services and pet care they might need. And um, know what resources are available in the community. Find out about what pet-friendly housing is available. By the way, it's a great website, apartments.com. You can look up any community in the country, give you a list of the rentals, and you can scroll, filter through there for which ones accept pets. And veterinarians need to be plugged into all these networks as well. They've traditionally been excluded. We can bring therapy animals into counseling sessions, which again, expedites building the rapport with the clients. I teach a 10 week online course, a certificate course in animal assisted therapy. If you're interested in that, email me. There's the website there. I'll give you more information about that. Veterinarians, like I said, need to be as proactive with this as pediatricians are. Don't have time to go into the whole 40 year process of how we've gotten there, but veterinarians are now starting to get involved with this. It's called One Health or One Welfare, in which animal welfare and human welfare and the environment are all under one umbrella. And you can see that it also includes the link and human and animal abuse in many different dimensions there. And the newest dimension of this is getting better what I call DV and the DVM, getting veterinarians to begin to recognize that many of their clients are experiencing domestic violence. This started in Scotland in 2016 when the Scottish government put a million pounds into training for frontline professionals to respond to domestic violence. And then they had to identify what professionals are most likely to encounter and abuse women. And they identified three beauticians, dentists, and veterinarians. In 2015, the New Zealand Veterinary Association signed on to a national domestic violence initiative by defining 
Veterinary medicine as a three-dimensional profession with a unique voice to protect animal life, human life, and the environment. And you may have seen this video came out in uh, 2018, a case in Florida where a woman was being held by her abusive boyfriend at gunpoint, conned him into believing the dog needed to go to the vet, slipped a note to the front office staff, they called the police, and he was taken away. Working with elder care, there are a lot of things social workers can do. Recognize the link, recognize these attachments, help them find support services, make referrals for when they have to go into hospital long-term care, bring therapy animals into long-term care facilities, work with the hoarding issue. And one key thing here, when somebody brings all their animals into a veterinarian and asks them to have them put to sleep, call the 988 suicide prevention hotline. It's a surefire sign they're thinking of killing themselves. And the newest area here is working with homeless populations who are deeply attached to their pets. Here's a great video it was shot in Scotland a number of years ago, talking to homeless uh, folks on the street with uh, their pets and the intense attachment that they have, the housing restrictions, their need for veterinary care as well. So I wanna leave some time for Q&A. Again, leaving you in summary here, get rid of this model here. The link connects the dots and shows that in fact, all these forms of family violence are related. They overlap and people can see multiple forms of it. And the can, animal abuse is the abuse canary in the coal mine. The canary in the coal mine of abuse of home may literally be an abuse canary. By responding to the injury or death of that canary, we can potentially save many other pets and people. So I'm sorry if I went through that so quickly. <laughs> Uh, somebody, I think, is going to you know, give me some questions from the chat room. Again, feel free to visit our website. We've got all these resources out there. They're free. If you'd like to subscribe to our link letter, just send me an email. Just in your um, signature there, just let me know what agency you're with. Um, and again, please donate to the National Link Coalition. Um, so anyway, let me turn it back over there. And I think, uh, let me see, Grace, are you going to uh, be fielding this question? I am, Phil. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And I just wanted to share with you how many compliments are in the chat thanking you for your expertise and knowledge. So we'll try to go in the next few minutes through as many questions as we can fit in. Please remember, if your question is not presented to Phil, you may email him directly uh, regarding anything we are not cover able to cover here today. So Mary asked Phil, is there any research on how rescue groups are also victims of violence when working in the community to do TNR? No, I haven't seen anything about that. The only thing I've seen recently, which is not related, uh, we're gonna have an article in the March link letter comparing rescue groups and non-rescue groups and how many of them are actually animal hoarders. Uh, but nothing about violence of uh, affecting people doing trap, neuter, and release programs in communities. I haven't seen anything about that. Christine asked, uh, a, she had a child that she worked with that had killed a puppy and he experienced severe sexual abuse while he was with his parents. She was wondering if there was any um, therapy treatment or s assessment that she could utilize to determine if he will reoffend. Uh, there are a number of tra uh, treatment programs out there uh, probably the most popular one is called Anicare, A-N-I-C-A-R-E. There's also Anicare Child. Uh, this was, program was developed by the Animals and Society Institute. Uh, there are other assessments and tra uh, treatment programs out there. I'm not a psychologist. I can't really comment authoritatively on which ones might be, might be better. None of them have ever really been evaluated for effectiveness. Um, but there are programs out there. Um, I mentioned Barbara Boat earlier. She has an inventory of animal-related experiences, and there are several others. But I would start with Anna Care or Anna Care Child. Uh, go to the Animals and Society Institute as a starting point. Maria asked if there are any studies that you're aware of that create the link between human violence and the so-called um, Finnish meat or backyard butcher markets that are largely found in Florida and also with any ritual killing of animals as alleged religious practice? Uh, no to the first one. I'm not familiar with the backyard butcher. There is a growing body of literature on uh, animal violence and community violence among uh, people working in informal slaughterhouses and meatpacking facilities. And if anybody wants information on that, I've got a bibliography on that. Just email me and I'll send that to you. 
uh, on the ritual killing, uh, ritual that came to a head in Florida back in the 90s with a Santeria case in, uh, was it Broward County, I believe it was, um, where the, um, my mind just went blank, the, the Supreme Court had a rule on it and basically said the town's ordinance restricting Santeria uh, practices was, was too narrow. Um, we don't really have any statistical information that I'm aware of and how often this occurs. Uh, there are certainly cases where animals are sacrificed uh, in the name of religion and um, as part of religious rituals. We see that in Afro-Caribbean cultures uh, so, to some degree, but I, I don't have a lot of detail on that. It's a great question though. Heather asked, what resources are available in Pennsylvania for families with issues of animal hoarding and traditional hoarding? Uh, I don't know of any specific state-related hoarding um, uh, resources that are available. Um, again, if you go to our website, um, we have a bibliography and there's a, a section in there on animal hoarding. Uh, so, well, actually, we have several sections on there on animal hoarding, plus the bibliography as animal hoarding. And there are all sorts of resources listed there. I don't know of any specific uh, state-related uh, approaches to that. Emily asked, does the type or severity of animal abuse predict future behavior of the offender? She gives the example, does participating in torture or dismemberment predict future homicides? Or does animal killing as a form of intimidation predict spousal homicide specifically? Yes, <laughs> short answer to that is, is yes. Um, the more hands-on the violence is um, against humans or animals, the more likely somebody is to, you know, uh, be more a more serious offender. Andrew Campbell's work in uh, Indiana was showing that quite dramatically. Yeah. Ivy asked, in terms of hoarding, how do you distinguish between a family or pet owner who did not intend to hoard but could not afford, for example, low cost spay or neutering due to barriers? Uh, very difficult to do that. Uh, it's on a case by case basis for starters. Uh, trying to prove intent in any criminal case is difficult. Uh, there are always extenuating circumstances one way or another. Um, the one way to start is at least in urban areas, many communities have a limit as to how many animals somebody can have. Four dogs, four cats, five dogs, five cats or whatever. But unfortunately in unincorporated uh, counties or rural areas, there often are, are no such limits. But if there is such a limit, then we can use that as a starting point to say you have to get rid of so many animals. Um, if they say they can't, you know, afford spaying and neutering programs, you just have to tell them owning an animal is a responsibility. It's not a right. You have to be prepared for expenses. You have to, you know, segregate the animals when they're in heat so that they don't breed. And there are low cost spay and neuter programs available all over the all over the place. Great. And the last question we have for today, Phil, is are there studies on the effects of children having a pet being taken away? Um, because, for example, a mother could not handle it or letting the pet into a risky situation. Um, Maria is very concerned about children being told, what are you crying for? It's only a dog, for example, if a dog was harmed. I don't know that I've seen anything specifically about pets being taken away, but we have a lot of literature just on the emotional impact of, of on children of their pets. And you know, by extension, I think we can say when those animals are taken away or they disappear or they die, I mean, it is a, uh, uh, a devastating impact on them. Frank Ashione uh, did a lot of research on this uh, among many others. Again, if you go to our bibliography, uh, you know, there's a whole section on there on, on pets and children, and you'll see all sorts of research. We probably have three, 400 uh, uh, papers on that. Wonderful, thank you. That concludes our questions, Phil. And as we wrap up this webinar for today, I'd just like to say in closing how delighted that we are to see so many of you joining us from various disciplines. I would like to thank our speaker, Phil Arco, the members of the Keystone Link, our project consultant, Vicki Denzer, and our friends, Liz and Jennifer from Talkie Tech, who kept everything running smoothly throughout the workshop. Last but never least, we would like to thank the Richard King Mellon Foundation. Since 1947, the Richard King Mellon Foundation has funded visionaries with bold ideas to advance prosperity in Southwestern Pennsylvania and environmental conservation across the United States. 
We hope that everyone will please stay tuned for further Keystone Link webinars. Our next webinar will be on the intersectionality of child and animal abuse. And subsequently, we will be exploring the intersection of animal and elder abuse. Please remember that there are general certificates that can be offered to members today from the Keystone Link. And if you live in Pennsylvania and you have an interest in this topic, please consider joining the Keystone Link. Our meetings are monthly and you may contact me at gcoleman at crisiscenternorth.org. Thank you everyone today for joining us. It was a delightful workshop and I'm glad to see so many resources that were shared amongst the chat. Have a great day. Thank you everybody.